it so easy for me to climb these stairs and prepare to deliver a gospel message. If you felt like you worshiped the Lord this morning, can you say amen? Amen. amen? amen. The God who has set me free. Are you free this morning? Are you really free? I remember the day he broke the chains that used to rule my life, and that was the greatest day I've ever experienced in my whole life to know that I don't have to live like that anymore, that I've been set free from such a terrible lifestyle of death and now I get to experience the abundant life in, uh, in Christ and I get to do it with all of you here today so hey, I thank God for that if you have your Bible I want you to turn to John chapter 6 we're still studying through this chapter it's a very long chapter and uh, and so there's many pieces and parts to it that are very important and uh, I want before we uh, begin to pick up our study where we left off last Sunday, there's a few things that we should remember, a couple of things that we want to have to keep in mind, a few constants that will not change all the way through this chapter. And uh, first of all, we're looking at the response of two totally different crowds. You know, Jesus, he ministers every day. Jesus preaches the gospel every day. It's not just on Sundays. It's not just on Wednesday night worship. The gospel is being preached every second of every day, every minute of every hour. Somewhere somebody is learning something about Jesus Christ. And there's always two different responses to that. There's a response that comes from the false followers or even the rejectors. And then there's a response that comes from those who have accepted them as their Lord Jesus Christ. And our study really does a good job. Showing us the different kinds of followers of Christ. Those who truly follow him and those who are just imitators and, and false believers. And so, uh, you know, we talked about the first group, the group of the disciples. We know that two of them didn't need much instruction to follow Jesus. They didn't even need a miracle. They didn't need any signs. All they heard was the uh, uh, prophet John the Baptist say, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that was enough. That was all those guys needed in order to sell their life to Jesus Christ. They said, you're it. I'm buying into your program. I need somebody to take away my sin. And if that's all you do for me, that's good enough for me to drop everything I have and to follow you. And, and these men, they left their homes, their families, their money, their careers. And they did all of that without any kind of crazy miracle that we, that we get to experience in the scriptures. Those miracles are wonderful and they're important and they're critical to prove who he is. But I want you to know some people don't need all that in order to follow Jesus Christ, specifically these disciples here. And we went down the list of the disciples, the first followers as we experienced in chapter 1. And there were many who decided to follow him without anything happening. And it wasn't until chapter 2 that Christ performed his first miracle. And when he performed that miracle in front of those who were already following him, boy, that really strengthened their faith. And, and I was really thinking about that. Like, how can that relate to a believer, to me, uh, in my life? And I was thinking about my little girls. Uh, Abby, Abby was a lot more courageous than Morgan and Madeline when it came to swimming. And I remember I used to, uh, the kids, they were never afraid for me to pick them up. Ever since they were babies, they would reach up. And they were never worried about my powerful arms you see those right there, ladies and gentlemen. I'll let you touch them after the service. Uh, but anyways, they were never scared that I wasn't able to bear them up. They would come to me when they were able to walk, and they knew that I could pick them up, and they knew that I wouldn't drop them, and they knew that I would hold them. But when it came to swimming, I'd have to coach them off of the edge of the pool. Come on, baby, jump to daddy. And they'd stand on the edge of my mom's swimming pool, and, and they would get real scared. And, and you'd have to get your two fingers in their hands first. And then they would start jumping from there. And as, as they experienced the miracle that I was not going to drop them when they jumped, they began to leap further and further into my arms. And they become to get very brave. And then they got very heavy and that quit. <laughs> my arms were not so strong anymore. And I want you to know, they still believed in me. And they believed in my strength. But when I revealed to them my power and my ability to hold them up, their faith in me as their father grew stronger. And that's what it's like for a Christian. You, you don't need a miracle to put your faith in God. But I'll tell you this, when you put your faith in him, it becomes easier and easier to jump into his arms because you see him do things that you just can't explain. You're just like, it's a God thing. And so that's how I would describe the disciples and their very beginning faiths in Jesus Christ and how God began to perform in front of them and all it did was strengthen what existed before the miracles, their faith 
enough to follow him. And the second group of followers, they happen to be the subject matter of today's debate. And this group of followers is the sign-seeking sort. We have churches in this city. They live to see miracles and signs in their auditorium on Sundays. And they only think they can happen in that building on Sundays. And so they go Sunday after Sunday. But those same happenings are not experienced Monday and Tuesday. It only seems to happen in those churches. And so they seek Jesus through those very bizarre things that they call signs and miracles in their congregation. They're not really following Jesus on a daily basis to begin with. And if they were, they would find out that Jesus doesn't operate just to perform some sideshow, some some event to he don't need to make you believe you have a free will it's your choice you can believe if you want he's not going to twist your arm and he's not going to do something spectacular hoping you'll believe what he has done already is spectacular enough amen that is enough what he did on the cross is enough and remember john the baptist said uh, behold the lamb of god who takes away the sin of the world that is enough to put all of your faith in him. There is nothing else that you need beyond knowing that is absolute gospel truth. And the man on the cross, the thief on the cross, he got that. He believed that. And that's all it took for a saving faith for him. And, but this other group, their faith is superficial. It depends entirely on Jesus' ability to meet their physical needs. It's always somebody coming with a physical need to Jesus. They don't say, Lord, I don't know how to get out of my sinful life of lust. Lord, I don't know how to give up alcohol. Lord, I don't know how. No, they're like, I got this leg and it's gimped and I need a repair. And Lord, I got a little bit of leprosy. Can you fix that? And it seems like everybody coming to them just wants their physical business healed. They don't need help anywhere else in their life. And, and Jesus, he can spot this type of believer from far away. And if you remember Jesus, he was leaving Jerusalem area and he was getting on this boat and he was trying to escape these thronging crowds. He saw this group of believers hearts from his boat as they were wandering the shoreline chasing his boat as he was trying to get away from them they began to chase down this shoreline in chapter 6 and verse 1 and and he could see their self-serving purpose he could see why they were chasing him they weren't chasing him because he had the words of eternal life they were chasing him because he could do something for them physically and that's all they cared about was their physical condition. And and Jesus, he could see their hearts, and he saw that they only followed him because they saw signs which he performed on those who were uh, diseased. And so I think it's interesting. Christ saw their heart. He saw their motivation, but Mark tells us that whenever Jesus got to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, he came out of his boat, and he saw the great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them. He saw their ambitions, he saw their motives, he saw their desires, and yet he hurt, and he wanted to fix that in their life. And he still wanted to perform. Maybe there's a chance for them. Maybe they'll turn it around. Maybe they'll believe. And so he, he came out of the boat looking at them like they were sheep not having a shepherd, and so he began to teach them. He didn't do miracles. He didn't perform major signs. He sat down and he began to minister to them and really tried to give them the information that leads to eternal life and I'm terribly grateful that despite my own selfish ambitions, I do have some. I know y'all think I'm perfect, but she can tell you I'm not, my wife. And despite my selfish motivations and despite my selfish lifestyle and, and, and my selfish desires, I want you to know I'm so grateful that the Lord is still compelled to have compassion on me. No matter how ungrateful I am, he still has compassion on me. He still loves me. He don't, he don't mark that down as a, as a score-keeping record in a book that he might spitefully reject me in a time of need later. But no, he holds everything together in my life through the teaching of the gospel, through the holy scriptures. And if I would just pull out my Bible and read it, he would fix it. If I would just find a relationship with them, he'd begin to work on those things in my life on more than just a, a, a physical level, but more eternal, something inward he'd give me that would never disappear. I want you to know you can have a bad knee. I know people who have had bad knees and had a knee joint replacement, and they wore that sucker out and had to get another. You can pray for all the physical healing you want. One day... There is no physical healing that's going to save you from dying. And you can pray for all the food you want to keep your bellies full, but one day you're not going to be hungry anymore. You can pray for all the the water that you need to satisfy your thirst, but one day you won't even be thirsty anymore. And so Christ is trying to tell them there's something more that you should believe in and that you should look into 
than your selfish desires and your physical needs and your physical conditions. And by the way, everything that you desire is a result of sinfulness of mankind, the fall. We become sick and ill and diseased and pain because Adam and Eve brought sin into the world. And so that's a consequence of sin physically. We're just looking for a Band-Aid. Spiritually, we need the potion, which is eternal life. And, and, and Jesus, he's the only one that can provide that. And so as I begin to kind of think through this group of believers, I try to understand, not believers, this group of non-believers, these false disciples that are following Christ along the seashore and, 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 uh, and, they, and they're thronging him about and asking him. I'm thinking about a particular group of people that me and my wife decided that we would help one time. And we did everything we could to help them. We opened our home to them. We bought them clothes. We provided food. Uh, we loved them. It was church, 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 Bible, Bible, Bible. We're mentoring. We're ministering. And for some reason, it was never good enough. More, more. They began to take all the liberal efforts they felt like they needed to to take what was ours and make it their own. They would keep our stuff longer than they should. They would take our stuff without permission. And they would begin to take advantage of us. And it was never enough. And, and that hurt us so bad. I can't imagine what Jesus' heart felt when these people were doing the same thing to him. He has given them and given them and given them. He's given them their energy, their strength, his strength, his stamina. He's given them food. He was producing miracles. He's making their sick wells. Never enough. They just need more signs. They just need more miracles. They need more of this. They need more than that. And, and people who come seeking physical needs, it's never enough for them. That's just how it is. Because physically, we're always in need. When we eat today, we're going to be hungry tomorrow. When we drink today, we're going to be thirsty tomorrow. When we're well today, we'll be sick tomorrow. When we're sick today, we'll be well tomorrow, and, and so forth and so on. And there's always going to be a physical need that is a perpetual thing of our flesh. But when talking about godly things and talking about the gospel and about Jesus Christ, there's one satisfa satisfaction forever, and that's the acceptance and the belief and Jesus Christ is the very Son of God and a member of the Trinity, the Holy Trinity. And so the difference between what I could do for this, these people, this group of people, and what God could do for them is very different. I could only provide for them physically. I could give them the stuff that they needed to eat. I could give them clothes. But what they really needed was Christ to satisfy a deeper hunger in their life and to fill a deeper hole. And what they needed was something that only Christ could give them. And he could only, only Christ could satisfy their thirst that they were longing for and and all I could do is simply just give him the things that he blessed me with like these disciples you know when Jesus he 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 commanded his disciples he said hey make the people to sit down in verse 10 and he says uh, now and there in that place there was much grass and so he set the men down in the number of about 5,000 and Jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks he distributed them to his disciples and then the disciples took that which they got from Jesus and they began to distribute it to this people and he gave them fish and they were filled and these disciples walked their little legs off I mean me and Jared and my mom and dad we went to a restaurant and uh last weekend and we walked that poor waiter's legs off and we were just one table I mean it was drinks and food and food and drinks and and we walked his little legs off but here these 12 disciples are passionately caring for this very ungrateful crowd of people whose hearts are on upside down and they just could not see the message of the gospel. And they just could not hear it. And, and they were only about themselves. And so Jesus, he gave thanks. And he had his disciples perform this very amazing miracle. But it only satisfied their physical needs. And therefore, it wasn't enough for them. And so they had to chase him to his next destination. And so as these people uh, began to try to take Jesus by force and make him their king. They were literally going to kidnap him, and they were going to make him their very own uh, food pantry, <laughs> one that never empties, one that never runs out. And they're like, we're going to make you our king, and you're going to have to provide for us. And, and Jesus, he's seen that they were getting aggressive and hostile. He put his disciples in a boat, and he sent them out ahead of them. And then he slipped away himself, and he went up on a mountain, and he hid from these people. And they tuckered themselves out looking for Jesus, and and so they laid down there in that soft grass where Jesus had fed them. And uh, the next morning they woke up, their bellies began to grumble. And they began to get hungry. And they found out that 
what they took from Jesus was something that is going to continue to be a problem. And so they're like, well, unless we have Jesus around, we won't be able to fulfill that problem. They woke up wanting breakfast, and Jesus was not there. And so they all chartered vessels. Most of the people have wandered off, but many of them chartered vessels, and they began to go to Capernaum to look for Jesus. And when they arrived there, verse 59 tells us that they found Jesus in a synagogue. He was teaching. And uh, just as Jesus saw this group of people before when they were chasing his boat down that shoreline, Jesus saw them and their wicked hearts chasing them again. He seen them coming into the synagogue, and he could tell that they'd been unmoved and unchanged by his compassion and even his miracle, yet it missed their heart in a very big way. And, and they still seek Jesus for all the wrong reasons. And, and Jesus said to them when they encountered him, and they asked him, Lord, how did you get here? By what means did you get here? He just ignored that question. It was irrelevant. It was small talk. They're just seeking small talk. They're really only there for one reason. They're hungry, and they have some sick people, and they need Jesus to deal with that. And Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, because you, but because you ate the loaves and you were filled. And we discussed last week that the word signs here is samion. And it has two meanings. One is a supernatural event. One is a miracle. And, and it's obviously done by a realm that is, does not exist in our normal life. And the other one is a sign that God chooses to use to prove that somebody is actually an oracle of his. Somebody who actually is sent by God. And, and that's the sign. He says, you don't seek me because I perform miracles and wonderful works. I mean, you don't seek me because I do that to prove that God has set his seal upon me. You seek me because the signs and miracles that I do perform are just enough to keep you alive physically. But you're not looking for an eternal work in you. And, and I know why you're here. It's because you ate of the loaves and you were filled. It's not because I am God's very own son. It's not because I'm the savior of mankind. You are here for a totally different reason. And, and so the ultimate welfare pan is what they saw in Jesus and so Jesus he then moves on to say to them do not labor for the food which perishes but for the food which endures to everlasting life which the son of man will give you and Jesus to which they responded to Jesus they said what shall we do that we may work the works of God and then Jesus responded to them with the only acceptable labor to get into the kingdom the only acceptable work to get into kingdom. Some of you are like, there's no works to get into kingdom. You can't work to get into king, into the kingdom. And, and I say, you're right. You really can't. But this is his response to those works. This is the work of God. That you simply believe in him whom he has sent. That's, that's all. That's all. You just need to believe in Jesus Christ. And, and when he says that, that you need to believe in him who he sent, he wasn't talking about you need to believe in him as the miracle worker, Jesus Christ the miracle worker. He says you don't need to just believe in him as Christ as the one who can provide for your physical needs. That would cheapen the character. What if that's all Jesus was? A miracle worker and somebody who can feed people were, who were hungry. What would that mean? Well, that would mean everybody would be lost, and then they'd die, they'd go to hell, and nobody would make it to heaven. And that would just really cheapen the character of Christ. And so instead, he said, believe in the one whom he sent. Who did God the Father send? I'll tell you who he sent. The one whom God has sent is the one who died for your sins. The one who bore your shame on the cross. The one who became sin, who knew no sin. The one who satisfied God's wrath on the cross. The one who conquered the grave after lying dead for three days in the tomb. God sent the one who sits in the throne room of God right now, making intercession on your behalf. God sent the one who is going to come back one day and bring his bride home. That is the one whom God sent. He didn't just send a, a mere miracle worker. He didn't just send somebody who can provide for physical needs of people. He sent one greater, and that's whom you need to believe in. And so our text today, it gives the question that burdens every would-be believer. Every would-be believer, even you Christians in here today, have asked this question. So I don't want to be too critical on this not believing part, but I want you to hear me out. This is what they said when they were asked, uh, when he said, all you have to do is believe and the one whom God sent, they're like, huh, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work 
will you do? That's something every would-be believer and every believer has asked in their heart of hearts. What would you do to prove to me who you are, who you are? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we begin to dive into this scripture, Lord, I pray that you'd answer this question to the person seeking it today. I pray, God, that you'd reaffirm our faith in you today, those of us who have trusted in you. I pray, God, that your spirit would have his way with us. I pray, Lord, whatever it is in our life that is interfering with our ability to concentrate and focus on you, Lord, would you use your spirit of influence that we might give you all of our attention, Lord. Let us not waste this warm, comfortable auditorium. Let us not waste this place of shelter. And God, let us not waste our time in your word, but let us fully concentrate on every word of the gospel that we might be changed today for our good. Not for yours, but for our own, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to read verses 30 through 35 for you, and we're going to dive right in, okay? Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven. But my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. I've got a three-part sermon. Uh, simply because if I go to four, that's too complicated for my small brain. And so I try to keep it with small numbers. We've got three points. The first point I want to draw your attention to, this is something very new to me. This is something that the Lord revealed to me just most recently, and, and uh, I want to share this wonderful truth and treasure with you today. The misquoted response, verses 30 and 31. And so after Jesus gives this self-seeking group the charge, here's the charge. You want to know how to work the works of God? You believe in me. You believe in the one whom he sent. After he had said that to them, that this is your only performance, this is the only labor, this is the only thing you can do to gain everlasting life. Then he, says to the, then he goes on, he says, this is the only way you can please God the Father is to believe in him whom he sent. After this charge is given, would you believe it? This fickle group of people, they ask him, what sign do you show? Is this not the group that just 24 hours ago got fed by Jesus? Thousands and thousands of people. It's one day sooner. Would you believe that that's the first thing they ask him when he says, you just need to believe in the one whom he sent? They say, well, give me a sign or a miracle. When are signs and miracles going to be enough for this group of people? That's Jesus' point. This is the point of the entire operation of Christ. When he begins to give you everything you want, I'll explain it to you like this. I started a bad habit, ladies and gentlemen. Can I share a little personal life with you? See, we started going to the QT Sunday mornings on our way to church. I started a very bad habit. It's like a spending spree in there. I let my kids have whatever they want. And never is it enough. <laughs> they need more signs and more signs and more miracles. And so I make it rain peppermints on their little hearts and, and chocolate milks and sodas. And, and, and that's the point. That Jesus is trying to make. You know, if you come seeking a sign, you'll never stop seeking signs because they're awesome. They're incredible. They're amazing. And they're thrilling. And they're exciting. So naturally, you're going to be into that. But whenever they fall away, so does your faith in Jesus Christ. And when you don't get a sign because you think you deserve one, then you begin to fail in your practice of worship of the one true God and you are found out to be a real false believer like this group here. And, and this crowd, they want another sign. They're like, they're like miracle junkies. They just need one more fix from the Lord that they might believe one more day. Just give me one more, give me one miracle a day. I'll believe one day at a time. But if you ever not give me a miracle in one day, then all of a sudden my faith in you will become dry like my bitter heart. And, and then they go on to tell Jesus, they say, oh, by the way, our fathers, they ate man in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. The false disciples have made a huge mistake right here. I want you to know, I want to tell you something right now. If you're going to use scripture against Jesus Christ, you better get it right. Amen? If you're going to claim something from the Bible, 
you better get the context right because it will be embarrassing for you and it will be devastating for you. When you find out that you're using the scriptures wrong. I know I've heard people say, uh, well, whatever you ask in Jesus' name, you're going to get it. Really? I, I, asked, I remember I tried that once for a Ferrari. I still have no Ferrari, ladies and gentlemen. That doesn't work all the time. The scripture needs to be taken in a way that makes sense not to us, but to God. The way he said it, not the way we heard it. And so our ears need to be tuned in. And so I want you, this is a special treasure, something very unique. I just found it. It's hot off the press. Open your Bibles to Psalm 78. I want you to look at the scripture that these false disciples decided to throw in the face of Jesus Christ. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. They're taking this scripture completely out of context. They took one verse of scripture and they are yielding it against Christ and trying to make him perform the way they believe he ought to perform. And so this psalm is written by Asaph. He's a prophet of God. He was a musician and a prophet. And he decided to use the words and music to carry the message of God to the people. He used his music to share the, the gospel of truth and to share with the people those, those divine uh, words that the Lord gave to him. And he's been described as someone who understood the blessings of God and he also understood where they came from. And so he uses music to praise the Lord and to share this very scripture with the people that are coming down the chain. And so I want you to remember a couple things before we get too far into the scripture. First of all, he says, our fathers ate the manna in the desert. And so they have heard this story from their fathers. And their fathers have passed it down generation after generation after generation. Our fathers ate the manna in the desert. It is as, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And so as you open chapter 78 of Psalms, if you're there, say amen. Okay. Give ear, O my people, to the law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. This is Asaph writing a prophecy that God, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, instruction that God told him to pin down. He said, I'll open my mouth in a parable. I'll utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. What they say? Our fathers fed from the manna in the desert. And so here is Asaph picking up with their fathers. He's picking up where these guys say their source of information come from. And he says, we will not hide them from our children. We'll be telling to, to the generations to come the praise of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works he has done. I want you to look at that verse of scripture. They're going to share a testimony with their children and their children are going to share it with their children. Their children are going to share it with their children. And what is that testimony? Of the strength and wonderful works that he has done. That God has done. We're going to testify of all the miracles that the Lord has done so that our children may believe. Not that they might get extra miracles and added miracles to believe, but that they might believe their fathers in what their fathers had told them. Verse 5, For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers. In verse 6 it says, The generation come to might. Uh, the generation that is coming might know them through these testimonies in verse 7 that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God but keep his commandments and may not be like their fathers a stubborn and rebellious generation a generation that did not set their hearts aright and whose spirit was not faithful to God can you can you put a star there by verse 7 the reason these testimonies, the reason why the scripture that these men have in their hand that they are presenting to Christ and trying to hold him to account, verse 7 admonishes them from ever doing this. They're quoting from this psalm, and it says, they have testimonies handed down from their fathers of the great and mighty works of God that they might not uh, forget who blessed them, who is the one that gives them miracles, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. It may not be like their fathers, verse 8, star that one, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart aright and whose spirit was not faithful to God. And then he gives a description of Ephraim and how Ephraim forgot about the miracles of God and how he delivered them from their bondage and how the Lord provided for them. And so right on the day of battle, he decided to turn back. And verse 11 says that he forgot God's work and his wonders that he had shown them. Sounds like these guys had forgot 
the works of the feeding of the 5,000, right? This is the verse they're quoting at Jesus. I guess they didn't read the 20 some odd verses leading to the one they hand seated. Marvelous things he did in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt and the field of Zoan. He divided the sea and caused them to pass through it. He, was, he has made the waters stand up like a heap. And in the daytime also he led them with the cloud. And in the nighttime he let, led them with a light of fire. And he split the rock in the wilderness and gave them drink in abundance like the depths. And he also brought streams out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. But they sinned even more against him by rebelling against the Most High God in the wilderness. Now look at verse 18. What does it say that they did? And then they tested God in their hearts by asking for the food of their fancy. They tested God by demanding another meal from him. Yes, they spoke against God. They said, can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Behold, he struck the rock so that the water gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give us bread also? It sounds strangely reminiscent of the text that we are in. Can he provide meat for his people? Therefore the Lord heard this and was furious. Verse 22, because they did not believe in God and did not trust in his salvation. They did not believe in God and trust in his salvation. We're just two verses away from what they yielded against the Lord Almighty. Yet he had commanded the clouds above and he opened the doors of heaven, had rained down manna on them to eat and given them the bread of heaven. Nevertheless, he had compassion in his heart. He provided for them despite their rebellion and their unacceptance of him as God's very own son. He sent them food to the full. He caused the east wind to blow in the heavens and the power he brought in the south wind. And then verse 29, and so they ate and they were filled. He gave them their own desire. They were not deprived of their cravings. In verse 32, it says, in spite of this, they still sinned. They did not believe in his under, wondrous works. How dare they yield this scripture? How dare this word be upon their lips to the mighty God? And not knowing the context of it. Then they remembered that God was their rock. In the most, the verse 35. And the most high God their redeemer. Nevertheless they flattered them with their mouths. And they lied to him with their tongues. Do you remember that when he performed the miracle to them? They remembered oh yeah you know what. Maybe he is a prophet of God. Maybe he is doing a wonderful sign. He's doing wonderful work. Let's make him king. Let's make him king. And so they flattered him with their tongues. Just like. Asaph is telling us that this same, the fathers of these kids were doing, what they decided to do. Worship God, but in their hearts, they really didn't want to worship him. They are just content with what he was able to provide for them physically. Nor were they faithful to his covenant, but he being full of compassion, he forgave their inequity. It did not destroy them. Yes, many a time he turned his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. How often they provoked him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Yes, again and again they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember his power. And when he worked, verse 43, his signs in Egypt and his wonders in the field of Zoan, he turned the rivers into blood and their streams uh, that they could not drink. And we have illustration after illustration of great miraculous works and signs. And throughout the ages, the Lord has proved who he is. But it's never enough for the sign-seeking crowd. They, it's not enough that they believe their parents that the one who is coming is actually here. It's not enough that they believe John the Baptist. This is a prophet. It's no ordinary man. This is one of their father's lineage in the Levitical temple. He is, he is in a, a, a holy priesthood that has carried down the traditions that are supposed to be followed all the way back from when this scripture was written and before. Verse 52, but he made his own people go forth like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. And he led them on safely so that they did not fear. But the sea overwhelmed their enemies and he brought them to his holy border. He delivered them out of Pharaoh's hand. He parted the Red Sea. This is real history. It's not some fictitious story. And so they give up on these signs and miracles. They get used to them. They're, we're the children of Israel. We deserve miracles. We've earned them. Don't you know who our father Abraham is? You not know you owe us, God, a promise? 
you made a promise to him. Yet they tested and provoked, verse 56, the Most High God. How many times do we see here that they tested and provoked? Tested and provoked. Do you see the theme here? And then they turned back and acted unfaithfully like their fathers. In John chapter 6 and verse 66, I know that's a weird scripture. That's a weird number. I don't like it either. But that's the scripture that these false disciples walk away from God. This is the moment they said, we can't take this anymore. We're not chasing you in boats anymore. We're not running down the seashore anymore. Because you're not doing the things we want you to do. You're just doing the things you want to do. And in that verse, just like verse 57 in our text, they turned back and acted unfaithfully like their fathers. But then you get to the end of that psalm, beginning in verse 68, it talks about that wonderful passage that the Messiah would come through. And so he chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loved, and he built his sanctuary like the heights, like the earth, which he had established forever. He also chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheepfold. It's the bloodline of Christ. And from following the ewes that the young he had brought to him, the shepherd Jacob, his, to shepherd Jacob, his people, and Israel, his inheritance. And so he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart, and he guided them by the skillfulness of his hand. He seen them like sheep who needed a shepherd. They picked this scripture, really. Is this the one that is going to bring Christ into submission and subjection of their selfish ambitions and desires? I tell you, no. Instead, it made clear their motivation when they presented this scripture. Let them know that they were a works-seeking generation. I like how Matthew describes this group of followers. An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was, in, was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That's the last sign he's going to give those people. That's going to be their last chance. I'm going to raise from the dead. If you don't accept it from there, it's over for you. You will die and go to hell forever. And so the, their motivation has been put on full display. And what do they do? They're, they're trying to compare Jesus to Moses. Did you pick up on that? Our fathers were fed in the wilderness by Moses. Our fathers. What does that mean? Well, Moses, he, he did more than just give us one meal. He fed us for 40 years. We ate every day for 40 years. That's how great Moses is. And you know what? Moses did more than feed 5,000 people. What Moses did is he fed millions of people for day after day after day after day. And, you know, I mean, if you were going to be somebody of God, you'd be more like Moses. And do you hear the condescension that is now building in the way they are addressing their Lord and their God, their King and their Savior? Not the same response you get out of a true follower of Christ. He said, they said, if we're going to be, believe you, if we're going to buy into your program, we need something above those things which Moses even performed, and maybe at least very equal with it. And it brings us to our second point. The misinterpreted rebuke. Then Jesus said to them, Most surely I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. Moses didn't feed you in the, in the wilderness, you numb skulls. My Father fed you. It come from heaven. It didn't come from Moses. If you're not going to believe that, how are you ever going to believe that my father sent me? If you don't know that God sent the food to feed your fathers, then you're not going to know that God sent me to feed your soul. You're not going to get it. Now, I agree, it would be a lot easier for Jesus to just go ahead and perform a miracle, right? He can do it easily. And I've been there before. I've been there before. I've, I, 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 I've asked God before. I'm like, Lord, can you just manifest yourself into a way to this person that they just might believe? Everybody in here has a family member, a loved one, a spouse, that you have begged God to do some miracle so that the person you love can be a believer. We've all been there. We've all wanted that. And I agree with, with these guys. And I'm like, Lord, just, just do a miracle. But I, re I remember that that's not the character of Jesus Christ. He don't need to do all that to be king. He don't even need us to follow him. He don't even need us to be in his kingdom. He desires us to be there. He wants us to be there, but he wants us to want to be there also. In the right condition, in the right heart, in the right mind, and in the right spirit. And to better understand why Jesus doesn't perform these outlandish public displays of miracles every time it's demanded of him, I think about Matthew 
chapter 4, and I think about the temptation that Christ had to endure in the wilderness when the devil came to him and began to ask him to do certain things. And Jesus was in the wilderness. This is right before he set off on this ministry that we're exploring with Jesus right now. He goes into the wilderness. He begins to prepare himself for the ministry. And what he does is he goes there and he says, you know, I'm going to fast here in this wilderness, and I'm going I'm to give up food so that I can give all of my attention to God the Father. I'm not even going to be distracted by a meal. And when my belly hungers, I am going to seek the Lord more for my sustenance. And, and so then Satan comes to him, and, and he says, Hey there, Jesus, you, uh, you see these little rocks right here? You know, why, why, why don't you just convert these into bread? Why don't you just turn them into bread? You know, we've seen them turn water into wine. We know Christ could easily do that. But look what... Jesus' response was a correct use of the scriptures. It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's the character of Christ. He knows we got to die. It's appointed for man to die once. We all got to die. He can't feed us forever because how you feed a dead person? You just can't do it. But every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God is the important part of the scripture. So he didn't come to provide bread for the belly aching, hungry only, but to provide spiritual sustenance. Our physical life is temporal. Our spiritual life is eternal. When we die, we go somewhere. Everybody lives for eternity. The light doesn't just turn off. You either live eternity in the presence of God, worshiping him in heaven, or you live for eternity in hell. But there is no death, and it's over, and it's not that easy. There's an eternity somewhere in some place. And Matthew chapter 4 and verse 5 tells us about the next temptation. Satan attempted to enlist a, a spectacle performance out of Jesus. And, and, and this would have been a good opportunity for Christ to reveal to the world who he was. It really is. I'm, I'm wondering why Christ wouldn't do it. This sounds like a good idea to me, but who am I? I'm not God. And, and so Satan, he, he takes him up into this holy city, and he sets him high on this pinnacle of the temple, and he puts him over this giant crowd of people, and he says to him, he says, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Now Satan's using scripture against God. Do you think that's a good idea? No. Jesus said to him, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Here Satan is asking Christ to perform a miracle to win souls. And Christ says, that's tempting me to do something that would not glorify the Father. I am here to do the Father's will. I'm not here to prove to anybody Anything other than what God needs me to prove to them. And right now it is not making a spectacle of my deity. Satan tried like these false disciples in our text to use the scripture to bring about a sign or a miracle. And, and Jesus, he just didn't take the bait. The last temptation Jesus experienced as I prepare to move to a close is in Matthew chapter 4. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, all these things I'll give you if you'll just fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. The Lord responded perfectly with scripture to every single incident that come up in his life. He got the context of the material correct and he can perfectly defeated the enemy in that moment. Now, I want you to know, when you're going through things in your life, it's important that you know Scripture because they're going to get you through those horrible and terrifying circumstances. It's going to strengthen your faith in your Lord Jesus Christ, but you've got to get the context right, especially when you're asking for something from God. And, and Jesus has rebuttaled this ar uh, argument as the same that we should all share in common, that, that we should worship the Lord our God and Him only shall we serve. And that doesn't have an and one and an add one. If He would perform this miracle, then I will come to church more often. If He would do this thing for me, I'll read my Bible more often. If you were to do these things, then I would be uh, more inclined to participate in the ministry work of your church. But instead, we should just worship the Lord our God and Him only shall we serve. I want to ask our music leaders to come and prepare a song of invitation. As I read the next statement Jesus said to them, 
as he rebutted their requests. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. These people got Moses' scripture all wrong. They thought that Moses was speaking about himself when it says that manna come down from heaven, that Moses caused the manna to come down from heaven, and, and they just weren't really giving the credit to God for the blessings in their life. Matter of fact, they felt like they deserved it. Me and my daughter, my wife, and we've been working on our prayer time before we eat a meal. Sometimes it's habitual. Sometimes we say the same thing over and over and over again. It's always, dear Lord, thank you for his food. Thank you for all you've done for us. We ask your blessing on it in Jesus' name, amen, and we close it. I want you to know when your prayer life becomes just this, almost like a repetitive statement over and over again, I think you've forgotten who you're talking to. I think you've forgotten who you're talking to. We don't deserve that plate of food in front of us. We're not special. There are people in this world that don't get a plate of food in front of them every meal. There's people in this community who don't even get that. Here we have these false disciples of Christ. I'm guilty for the same actions that they have. I feel like the Lord owes me something sometimes. And I pray a weak, habitual, similar prayer that just falls short of the glory of reaching God's throne room. And is that, are we all guilty of that? Is that just me? Let's go to the Lord and pray. Father God, we're looking for a change in our habits, Lord. We're looking for a holy intervention. God, I don't want no transcending miracle. I just want an interaction with you. Conversation with you. It's good enough for me to believe and change my habits. Father, I thank you that you are the God of my provision that I could trust in you and I put my faith in you. But Lord, maybe there's somebody in here who's not there yet. Lord, would you pour out a special measure of blessing upon their heart and strengthen their faith and encourage them, God, to make a commitment to you, Lord. Would you do that? I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.